Amen. So good to sing together. Uh, so good to open up God's Word together as well. And I want to invite you to ask you to turn to the book of James. If you don't have a Bible, um, maybe just lift your hand quick if you forgot yours or lost it. Um, anyone need one? We have extra for you. James chapter 4, looking at verses 13 to the end of, it'll be the end of your chapter in your Bibles, verse 17. Who are you to plan? That's the title of today's sermon, and so as we come to this passage, uh, let me read it aloud, and then I'll pray, and then we'll dig into God's Word. And so again, the Word of the Lord, James chapter 4. 15 to 17. Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we will live do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Let's pray. So Father, again, thank you for this great joy and privilege to gather as a church sing praises to you. I pray to you now to again have our Bibles open once again and to hear from God. Lord, we thank you that you've spoken to us clearly through your word. Lord, again, I have nothing to say. Would you help me in my weakness? Lord, help me. Lord, that I would make clear what our God says. It would be clear through your word and I would not say anything that does not need to be said. Lord, so, yes, Lord, in a sense, would you anoint my mouth? Lord, would you um, guide me in my mind, my thinking, and help? And would you help us as a church, then, to humbly receive your word? So, Father, sanctify us as a church, change us, Lord, and would you apply your word? So we ask it, Lord, we ask expectant, Lord, that you'll do this depending on you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, uh, the title of today's sermon, uh, Who Are You to Plan? I think last week I noticed I said the title and then there was a different title on there. Just ignore me if I do that, um, <laughs> if that's the case. And so uh, today I think the title is going to be the same, but Who Are You to Plan? Kind of a, a question, you'll see it in James, why I'm asking this question, why I've titled the sermon this way. Uh, the passage is about planning, and I wonder uh, if you would call yourself a planner. I wonder how many of us today are planners. Don't have to show hands. Some of us in uh, my family are planners, and some of us are not. If you know me, you know who that is. But are you a planner? Um, I think in some ways we're all planners. Are you planning on having people over, maybe after the service today? Are you planning to listen to the entire sermon before you leave? Are you planning uh, your whole yearly calendar? Have you had it planned? You got it all marked down? You got it up on a whiteboard somewhere? Planning, again, is pretty generic. Uh, in some ways, for me, as I'll just say, not a planner. I don't find planning necessarily that exciting. Some people get real fired up about planning. For me, I have to work really hard at planning. It's pretty generic, but in many ways, we just we all do it. We all plan. Whether you're a planner or not, you are a planner. So why does this matter? Why does planning matter? And again, if it's like, who are you to plan? And you're, I'm talking about plans. And if you're not a planner like me, you're maybe checking out and you're thinking this is like probably not applicable to me. Or at the very least, it's not that exciting. Why does this matter? Well, if you remember back and look back to a couple verses, again, chapter 4, verse 6. But if you remember back, we, we talked even last Sunday, faith changes everything. Faith changes everything, but we don't always live like it's true. And so we're told we need grace. Because that's, that's not always the case. We're changed. Faith changes everything. And we don't always live like it's true. And so we need grace in order to live like it's true. And if you look at verse 6, 
We're told this. We're told God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So he opposes the proud. We don't always live like it's true. And he, he pushes against the, the proud, but he gives grace to the humble to live like it's true. And verse 10, then, we're told, you can see it there, to remember, it's humble yourselves before the Lord. So if he gives grace to the humble, then we're to humble ourselves before God. And if again, if you remember from the sermon, it was then submit to God, draw near to God, be broken before God. But then if you remember the temptation to exalt ourselves above others. So humble ourselves, yes, before God, but the temptation is to exalt ourselves above others. And if, if you look at verse 12, so just before the passage that I read aloud, the one we're looking at, he says, who are you to judge your neighbor? So humble yourself, but humility here wasn't happening. And he said, who are you? Who do you think you are that you would judge your neighbor? Who are you to judge? And then today is, who are you to plant? God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So again, last Sunday, be careful judging others. Now we're looking at, be careful how you plan. As I plan, who do I think I am? Who am I to plan? As I plan, am I thinking of God in my plans? Is God a hindrance to my plans? Do you just wish, do I just wish that he'd stay out of my plans? Are my plans dependent on God or dependent on me? Am I planning even to do the will of God? So this question of who are you to plan, of how to plan matters so much. Humble yourselves before God and treat others humbly. Humble yourselves before God and plan humbly. And if we plan humbly, then you can also plan to receive grace from God. To live the Christian walk, your life. To to live like it's true, you've actually been changed, a redeemed worshiper, and to be able to worship the Lord. And so, in our planning, we must plan humbly. So three points this morning, and the first is this. Plan humbly, convinced that life is short. Plan humbly, convinced that life is short. He says in verse 13, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. He says, come now. Hey, you, listen. Come, listen here. Listen up. It's sort of that, that, that time of, and we do this with our kids sometimes. Kids, maybe you know times where it's like you get your full name said. Some of you as adults, it still bothers you. You know, come here, Kyle Glenn Hunter. That's my full name. Like, listen here, you planner. And so... Sometimes when that happened as a kid, maybe most of the time you're like, I don't know why I'm getting called, but I know I'm being told to listen here. Like, come here. I don't know why exactly, and I wonder if the readers here that this letter was going to, I wonder if they, if they knew. He says, come now, listen, listen here. Listen, it's urgent. Well, what's wrong with the planning? And if you look at the description, just in the description alone, it's not clear. So look, he says, he's a businessman, it looks like. He's got a good business plan. He's planned to start time. He says, you who say today or tomorrow. So there's a start time. There's a place. He's planned a place, such and such a town. There's kind of a timeline. Okay, I'm going to spend a year. And there's a strategy. He says, I'm going to trade and make profit. So this was a common thing. They weren't like, what in the world? What's he talking about? No, this is like merchant work. Uh, they, they get this. The business world, this was going on back then. They got it. At this point, I think like, okay, but why? Why are we called, like, listen here, it's urgent. Well, if you remember again, James is writing to this first group of believers, Jews. We're spread out. Not around Jerusalem, primarily like outside of that, anyhow. 
And as they're setting things up again, you can imagine starting over again if you've done that before. And you have someone that's like, hey, I've, I've got kind of my feet under me, and I've got a plan, and I know where I'm going. Like, in so many ways, it's like that's, that's not only good, that's like pretty exciting. And here's what he's saying. Kind of the summary. He says, look, you know what you're doing. You know where you're going. You've got goals. You're hoping for a profit. Maybe you're even saying, hey, I'm going to be a good steward of God's money. And then look at verse 14. And now we, now we get to, to, we figure out what is wrong. He says, and yet. Verse 14, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. Here's the thing, is like, no one knows. Does anyone know what tomorrow will bring? I don't. Is he saying, look, so uh, you should know. You should have known what tomorrow will bring. No. No one knows actually what tomorrow will bring. He's not saying you need to know. He's saying, look, don't plan as if you know. And, and that's the problem, is they were planning as if they actually knew, with certainty, with even an arrogance. And we'll see this. And he says to them then, and and now we definitely know this is what he means, because look at verse 14, goes on, he says, what is your life? Remember, like, who are you to judge your neighbor? Like, who are you to do that, to have this view of yourself? Who are you to plan like this, is what he's saying. What's your life? So, we're told, this is what our life is like. He says, for you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Plans or no plans, the character of your life is a mist. It's just a mist. We had some rain the other day and some warmth. I think for the first time that combination happened this summer. <laughs> My wife and I were having coffee. She's like, what's that? What is that? She's looking outside and it was um, mist or fog coming off the roof. It was hot, then it rained, and then you get that sometimes, comes off the road, comes off the roof. He's saying, this is what it's like, because it wasn't there long, even. Look at that, and then it was gone. And this morning, we've got, I was thinking about this, we've got these, uh, has anyone seen the glitter this morning? It's glitter everywhere. I try to get off, that, off that, that off my seat. It will probably be here forever. He doesn't describe our life like glitter on a seat. He says it's a mist. It's gone. It's here, it's gone. Short-lived. I'm not going to invite you over to my house and be like, "Hey, you need to check out uh, this certain cloud." Even it'll be, it won't be the same before I'm even off the phone with you. It's this mist that's here and then it's gone. Our lives are short-lived, and so, like, I, I, I think at many levels we know that, but do we plan humbly like that? Convinced that our life is short. I think, too, in our culture, like, we feel it short. Again, I don't think anyone's like, what? Life's short? We know it's short. I think in our culture, we feel the urgency of it more than ever. Is anyone busy? Like, don't, don't raise your hand. Like, and how about this? Have you ever met someone that likes this? Like, I'm trying to figure out what to do with my life. I got nothing to do. My schedule is so open. Oh, I get, oh sure, I can get together, because I have nothing on my, no, like, we're busy and we feel the urgency to get so much in it. And the days, let alone our lives, the day isn't long enough, we feel. So the point's not to cram in as much as you can. The point is to plan humbly. And I would say this, plan, life is short, plan for eternal life. If your plans are consumed with this mist, that's arrogant. Plan for life eternal. Without Christ, you only have this life. Without Christ, you just have the mist. You have it. It's here, and then it's gone. And then it's just eternal death. And that lasts forever, but it's not life. Life is a mist. There is no life past this mist without Christ. Only eternal death. So we know good news of the gospel through faith in Christ. He's earned for us a relationship with him starting now within the midst for all of eternity. We have life. 
And, and for us to think our life is in this mist is the most arrogant thing we could ever think. God, God has earned us eternal life. So why are we living like this is it? The world only knows this. And in a sense, they're right. That's all you get. So do all you can with what you got for as long as you have it. With whatever wisdom you think is wise. But we have eternal life because Christ conquered the grave. He conquered death by his death. And then he gave us life by his life. Like again, we have life. And so, so the Lord is telling us through his word, be humble then in your plans. We know, and, and, and the church of all people should know, life is short. Of, of anyone, we as a church should be able to say, let me tell you actually how short it is. And let me tell you how long eternal life is. Like true life. We say things like, and I, and I would say this, like, who are we to say we're building our forever home? I would say a better way to look at that would be I'm building my foggy home, my misty home. It's not going to last. And I think it's a great arrogance to the Lord when we say things like this. We're not building that. We can't build that. That's the Lord's job. It's not going to put him out of a job. When we say that we're building a lasting inheritance and we're speaking of dirt, or we say we're, we're just, we're, we're getting financial security. I'm, I'm a financial planner. But I'm not saying don't save your money or look after that. But when you're saying your security, when your plan ultimately is in those riches, it's arrogant. That's not riches. We know this as a church. We're not planning for those riches. We think health and we're not speaking of the resurrection. We've forgotten about that. And we're just consumed with the plan of I need to get better. The end. Your life is a mess. My life is a mess. Plan for eternity. Again, not as if this life is eternity. So, plan humbly. Convinced in your planning that life is short. And then secondly, convince God is sovereign. Look at verse 15. He says, instead, you ought to say. So, so you're saying, hey, I've got this plan. And, and again, this arrogance in it we looked at. Now he says, no, instead, you ought to say this. If the Lord wills, I will live and do this or that. Again, he says, you ought to say, if the Lord wills. And this is now the first time God is mentioned in the planning. And they haven't mentioned it. And how many times am I planning? God's like, not even there in my mind. I, I'm planning as if I'm an atheist. And he said, look, you ought to say, if the Lord wills. And this is, again, the first time God is brought into this. And they didn't bring him in. They need to be reminded. We need to be reminded. I need to be reminded of this. And Lord willing, Lord willing is not this. It's not you come up with your plans, and they maybe are moral. So like, I, I think these are fine. They, they work with my conscience. And then you've got your plan. You know where you're going. Even the businessman is good, 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 good. None of that stuff is wrong. And then at the end of it, you're like, well, like, okay, I can start saying that. Here's my plan. Lord willing. And that's, that is no different. And don't do this as well. As, I've got my plan, and this isn't wood, but you knock on wood. All right, like, Lord, I hope so. And we, we just don't know. What's he saying when he says, you, you ought to say Lord willing? Well, he's not saying start being superstitious. And now use God's name, really, as a superstitious quote. Lord willing. But you've already got your plan. God doesn't need you to add him in to, to kind of maybe make it work. And we have plans. We have plans. It's, it's, it would be maybe similar, and maybe the kids can relate to this. You ever have something you want to do? You want to play with one of your friends? You've got the plan. You know what you want to do. Now you're going to go to mom and dad and say, maybe Lord willing. Hopefully mom and dad are willing. But you've already got this, and you're going to be crushed if they say no. Because you've already decided it. And the Lord willing part is just like, kind of like, knock on wood, I hope it works out. I hope that my parents don't wreck my fun and we can do the same thing with the Lord. Man, I just hope he doesn't wreck this. Saying if the Lord wills is, is this. It's submitting to the plan.
plans of God and submitting and convinced that God is sovereign. That's what it's doing. And that's what he means when he says to say this. And there's, there's kind of two ways here he says that we submit to the sovereignty of God. And the first is submitting your timeline. So he says, like, God is sovereign and he will decide if we will live. Lord willing, we will live. Past today, to the end of the sermon, like into tomorrow. Each day is from him, it's a gift. We sang it, and I love that part in, in that song. You know, it's his breath in my lungs, right? Like, he gives me life and breath. If it's his will, then I will live. And he gives eternal life, like we said. Psalm 139, verse 16 says this. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me. When as yet there was none of them. Before you were even born, like formed in the womb, then God knew all your days to the end. He knows the last breath you will take. He knows it. He knows this. And so, Lord, if you will then, I know that my, hand, my, my life is in your hand. And so planning humbly, saying, again, Lord, willing, we will live. Because I do not add a second to my life. And yet we do things like in our fear, we say yes, but then in our planning, you ever spent maybe late at night worrying about loved ones? And I said, I hope they're going to be okay. I hope they're going to make it. I hope, I hope they're safe. You ever worry about yourself? And I, I, I don't know how I'm going to die. I wonder what that's going to be like. And we're fearful and we're consumed by it. And in our planning, we're we're planning with this in mind, and so it's good for us just to humbly be like, wait, my life is in the hands of the Lord. Like, I am invincible until he decides to take me. You don't live that then arrogantly. You live then humbly. What am I doing? Why am I spending this time acting as if I can plan for this in any way? Or maybe this, pridefully never considering at all when your time will come. You just don't even think about it. Man, we can think about it. And say, okay, Lord, like, Lord willing, I will plan for as long as I can until that day comes. When it comes, like, thank you, Lord. That will be good in whatever way it comes and when it comes. Second, so submit to the timeline. Secondly, then, submitting to God's sovereignty and submitting your plans to the details. So submitting to the details, God is sovereign, and he decides if we'll be able to, and he says there, to do this or that. It's pretty broad, but he decides, basically anything. You want to do this, or I don't know, maybe this? Well, it's his will. It's his sovereign will. Only by the will of God that we're able to do this one thing, or actually maybe this thing, or none of it. Proverbs 19, verse 21. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. This might be the first verse in the Bible that I can think of that rhymes. And I often say to my kids, I'm like, if it rhymes, it must be true. Well, this actually is true. <laughs> and it rhymes. And I'll read it again. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. It is God's purpose, not your plans. That will stand. Proverbs 16, verse 9. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. You've got your plan, and it, again, it's not wrong to plan. We're to plan humbly, knowing the Lord establishes your steps. Again, James is really, and that's why I'm taking as parallel passages from Proverbs. It is like the New Testament Proverbs. Matthew 5, again, James being the best description, you could say this half-brother of Jesus. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verse 10, if you remember how we were told to pray, and many of us, maybe not now, growing up in school, a Christian school, maybe you're still doing this, but for me it was in the public system, but you grew up on this prayer, a very 
popular prayer, common prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is how Jesus taught us to pray. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done. So we can say this, if the Lord wills. But then functionally, so the way that we live is actually like, but what I mean by that is I will. And we, we plan um, and basically declare our will over every scraped knee. How nap times will go over every sickness, bank account, holiday, how we figure our birthdays to go, a celebration. We got graduation now, this time of year. A family visit, um, baking or making of a meal. We say, my will. And I would say even down to traffic and down to the weather. Lord wills, but what we mean is actually, I will. So a question to ask yourself is, it is fine to have plans, but if you're gonna plan humbly, what happens when your plan I hope you plan. You need to plan. You plan to get here today. But what happens when your plan is thwarted? What happens when your plan changes? What happens when your plans change? How do you respond? I think that is very telling to say, look, is this really about God's will? Or is this really about my will? Not this way, God. I had a plan. This is wrecking it. Do we respond in faith? We're just focused and fixed on our will. And so he says in verse 16, As it is, you boast in your arrogance. And all such boasting is evil. So he says, look, here's the deal. Here's the deal. You, you boast, and, and not so much in, hey, check out that calendar, look at my plans, but it's in the arrogance of those plans. The confidence that you are going to do this no matter what, and no one, including God, in a sense, is going to get in your way. The great arrogance of it, that we do this. And he says, look, this is evil. It's actually evil. If the Lord wills, needs to actually be this. Please, Lord, only your will. And you see the difference. It's not just like, well, I guess so. No, it's like, humbly, I have these plans, and please, Lord, if you will, like, your will be done. And if it's the end of it tomorrow, okay, like, you're wise. And if it doesn't go the way that I think, or things happen, I'm like, why did that happen? That's not good. That I will trust you like Job. But I need your will to happen. I long for only your will, no matter how it looks. Give me faith. And that is planning humbly. Convinced that God is sovereign and good. And so finally, again, in, in planning humbly, when a plan convinced, obedience is required. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him, for that person, it's sin. And so notice this is not the sin of commission. You've committed something. So I, you know, I did something and I knew I shouldn't have done it. He's not talking about that. He's talking here of the sin of omission. I didn't do something that I knew I should have done. And so we would call that um, just fear. Or we would maybe call that laziness when that happens. And I, and I, I know what I should do, but I just haven't done it. You know, maybe I'll get to it. Maybe I won't. We call that laziness, maybe forgetfulness, maybe not prioritizing well, maybe not planning well. But look what the Lord calls it here. You can see, he says, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, it's sin. We sanitize and we say, no, 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 that's sin. You know what to do. 
We must plan to do, to do God's will. Remember James chapter 1, verse 22. You can turn there if you like, but that one verse, but <clears throat> be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Ah, oh, it's just this. It's just that. Well, he says, look, if you know what to do, you hear it. And if you don't do it, it is sin. You've deceived yourself, but that's okay. Well, I just don't know how it's going to work out. I just... Humbly plan to do God's will if it loses you your life. Be a doer of the word, not just a hearer, deceiving yourself. Obedience is required. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and it'll be on the screen there for you, a larger passage, Christ says this. So, end of the sermon, super important. It says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the lesson says, the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And then verse 26, another person, he says, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall. It's so clear that obedience is required. And any time, for whatever reason you have, that you actually obey your fears or your feelings, what seems to work, or the list goes on and it's not God, at whatever cost, it will not go well for you. Obedience is required. And so we plan humbly, believing and convinced, no, obedience in my plan, I must obey, it's required. And then later on in the garden, the night before the crucifixion, Christ prayed now in the Sermon on the Mount, is put into practice. He preached it, and it's like, well, now, now it's go time. Remember, your kingdom come, your will be done. He said, pray that way. Build your house on the rock, meaning you know what to do, do it. Now Christ is in the garden, and what does he pray? Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. And he's talking about taking on the wrath of God, the cup of the wrath of God on himself. He says, Lord, if you're willing, take it away. Lord, if you're willing, listen to that. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. This is incredible. The Son of God didn't overcomplicate it in his arrogance or pride. No, 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 it's your will be done. And so we know this, John 6, 38, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He could have planned to be a carpenter, fixed people's chairs, I don't know, been a synagogue preacher, a healer, maybe a fishing guide. None of that stuff wrong. That would have been evil. The greatest good that ever came was from the greatest horror that Christ ever went through which was the will of the Lord. The hope of the gospel. And, and so we are children of God through faith in Christ. So why would we think it would be different for us? And in our arrogance, think, well, I, I don't know. We'll look again at our Savior and say, look what he's done. And anything less would have been evil. So faith changes everything. You and I were changed plan to do God's will. You know, I've got a um, barbecue that's natural gas. I think I bought it secondhand. I think it's actually to be a propane barbecue, but someone converted it. Not well, because it doesn't cook very well. <laughs> but I love the barbecue. Regardless, you can take a barbecue, and you can convert it, and you can change the burners, and you can change the grates, and you can get this thing back in working order, so you can use it, in my case, natural gas. But it's changed to do something. 
I need this thing to cook some meat. That's what it's to do. And it would be a shame to have a barbecue sitting there, not doing anything, or only cooking vegetables, especially not cooking meat. That would be a shame. But we're told here, this is not a like, ah, oh, that's kind of a shame thing. Obedience is required. You were changed to obey the Lord. And this is not just like, ah, oh, what a shame. This is sin if we don't. This is great pride if we don't. You were changed to do the will of God. So what am I to do? And I would say just like honing it even on James, humble yourself before God. Submit to God. Draw near to God. Be broken before God. This is what we're told to do just, just, just previously. Repent before God. And do it again, and do it again, and do it again. And do not exalt yourself above others, but build them up. Plan humbly. So I would say this then, too, if you're going to humble yourself before the Lord, then we looked at this last Sunday, then plan to read your Bibles. Plan daily to be in the Word of God. Plan for it. Now, that there's grace. If you don't, what do we do? We be broken before the Lord. There's, there's always grace for the humble, but make a plan. Plan to be in the Word of God daily. Have an actual plan. Have a time. Plan for it. Plan to pray. Plan to learn how to pray. Plan to memorize God's Word. Plan to gather like this to worship. Plan to get sleep the night before. Plan what you need to do to plan to be on time or, or even early. But, but like make a plan. And now some of us have things that we know to do, people that we need to reach out to, and we need to plan to do it. People we need to reach out to for help, maybe, or confess to. People we need to forgive or encourage. People we need to witness to. Let's say this again, plan to do it. Ah, I don't, I don't know. No. Is it God's will? Plan to do it and plan to do it right away. You didn't know what tomorrow holds. So who are we to plan? Who do we think we are? Kind of a, a prayer in a sense closing would be this, I think would be fitting as Lord cause us to plan humbly. Like cause me to plan humbly. You have changed me by faith in Christ. Would I plan like that's true? Lord, give me more grace to plan humbly. That I would plan convinced that my life is short, convinced that God is sovereign, and convinced that I must do his will, planning to do your will, God. That my plans then would be redeemed for something greater than just kind of like this and this. My plans would actually be redeemed, that I would plan humbly, and even receive grace to plan more. Lord, for as long as you will. So let's pray with that in mind. So Father, Lord, we thank you that you are sovereign. And now, Lord, we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Wherever you lead us, to whatever valley, Father, we trust you. Would you help us to trust you? You are sovereign. You are good. Lord, our lives are so short, but Lord, we have eternal life. Lord, would we plan now in light of eternal life? Lord, would you help us to plan? Would you redeem our planning? Lord, when our plans are off, Lord, would we humble ourselves before you? And again, Lord, would you redeem our planning? Would we receive more grace to plan in a way that matches who 